So our next session is the right kind of wrong, disrupting for innovation. And speaking about storytelling, it's become so hard in this time where information is just too much to create stories that sticks. But humans have used storytelling for eternity to pass on culture and knowledge. And every storyteller has a unique story, and every listener has a unique perception, if they listen. Our next speaker is going to inspire us to tell better stories that sticks and to get us to get the attention we deserve. Ladies and gentlemen, give a big hand to Pierre Cromwell. Ah, it's working. Hi, everyone. My name is Per Cromwell, and I have, for the last 10 years, trying to figure out what makes up a good story. And these 10 years, I've been working with a lot of different projects and clients and things. And what I'm going to tell you today is a little bit about the learnings that I've learned from these 10 years. Uh, the things that I'm going to show you today is basically things that I've been doing with, uh, from a company called Studio Total, which I started uh, 10 years ago with my cousin, Thomas Massetti. For the moment, I'm, we actually closed it down uh, a year ago uh, at, at its peak, sort of, because we didn't want it to become boring. Uh, so I've founded a new company with Christoph Brunmeier. This is my friend. This is our civil clothes when we're out shopping. Uh, I've also started an innovation lab called Nordic Society for Invention and Discovery where we're currently trying to reinvent the hockey puck, trying to make that look, trying to add some drama to the game of hockey together with Itala. And we're also building this flying carpet for dogs, which is really hard, actually. Uh, it's a very small one. We're using magnetic things. Um, but basically, I've been in advertising for 20 years. The last 10 years, I have not been doing one single ads, and that is because I think that the old way of doing, doing communication is dead, or at least it's, it's uh, dying. So this is basically, in 30 seconds, why I think it is dying. This is Times Square, way back. This is also Times Square. I guess where you, you can all see where this is going. It's more like more and more ads, and it just like keeps on going and going. And at some point, the bucket is full. If you every year increase the volume a little bit, sooner or later your audience will end up deaf. Uh, and we are past this point by far. And I think already when this was working, it was not really working. This is Sam Pedrosa. He's like an environmental planner in LA County. This is like way back. Now he's is doing some planning work or trying to cast a spell on a big leaf. And he actually said that he could, they could measure in their systems when there were a commercial break back in the 60s, if there were like a popular show like I Like Lucy or I Love Lucy, they could see that everyone was going to the toilet. So basically no one wants ads. And now things have changed even more. As soon as the remote control was introduced, as soon as there were like a commercial break, some sort of distraction, something that was part uh, tr trying to keep you away of the content that you actually wanted, you could easily switch channel. Now there is like not only remotes, there are second screens or third screens. I call this uh, theory death by remote. Uh, and basically, you could divide the world in two parts. Either you're part of the distraction, which is basically the ad that you could usually skip after five seconds, or you're part of the content. So basically, I've tried now to compile a list of six ways that you could get your message out in a simple way based upon some of the experience and work we did back in the days at Studio Total. So first, people tend to talk about products, meaning that products is actually a way better mean to get to carry a message than ads are. Um, we explored this a little bit when a small clothing company came to us, fashion company, and they said that they wanted people to understand that they had the ultimate Father's Day gift. 
The years before, they have tried to talk about this by placing ads, but no one was really paying attention. So we said, okay, let's do a product trying to actually prove that they had the best Father's Day offer of everyone. So what we did is that we created the ultimate Father's Day gift. It was like an iPod speaker. It was the biggest iPod speaker in the world. We called it Wall of Sound. It weighed like 100 kilos, and it was like super big. Um, and we built it for real, and we presented it, and we showed it at their store. And then we sent this story out to the media, and the media, of course, thought that this was fun. Uh, a small, like, side thing that everyone could remember. Try to do, as soon as you do something that's just vaguely related to Apple, you get, like, a lot of attention. Uh, this worked very well for us. It became one of the most talked about audio gadgets in the world. We even competed against Apple at the T3 Gadget Award. Uh, as the audio gadget of the year. Everyone tried to kind of describe it in terms of huge, uh, enormous, humongous, biblical, until this story ended up in Forbes, the Indian edition, where they tried to describe it like this. This is really weird. They tried to describe it as the size of a small woman, which is like a super weird comparison. Uh, but this story kind of... This product carried the message of the ultimate Father's Day gift. Everyone wanted to come to the store and actually see this speaker. Everyone heard about it. And then, of course, they could buy the underwear or the socks or whatever. Uh, but this like, oh, is a way of packaging a message in a very easy way by saying that it's actually a product. Uh, another thing that we're doing is, or that we did, is connecting what's unexpected, trying to create, finding different parts to create like, the perfect story. For instance, a couple of years ago, people started using this EEG technology for measuring brain waves, and it became accessible. What we did was then that we took this interesting technology, we combined it with dogs and a company selling dog food because they said that they wanted to understand dogs better. They really was caring about the dogs and what the dogs were thinking. So we created a device called No More Woof, which actually measured the brain waves of dogs, translated that into English. Uh, and then we told this story, and people tended to like this. This is from, maybe we got some. A new device is being developed that could translate a dog's thoughts into English. It's ideal for anyone who wants a device that's constantly saying, Doo! <laughs> So that was Saturday Night Live talking about the no more wolf. And of course, the company doing the dog food got like a lot of attention out of this, just like by slightly combining these things. Uh, making enemies. Most people, at least when I was working way back with advertising, they were very afraid of doing anything that someone could, could consider being bad or being someone would be upset with what's, what what they were doing. We say quite the opposite. We're always trying to find the right enemy, trying to get people to be angry with you because that kind of starts a discussion and it's very hard to be liked by everyone. Then you run the risk that basically no one cares about what you're doing. This is the leader of the Swedish feminist party, Gudrun Schumann. They had like a lot of people that did not really like them, uh, but they were not really that loud. So we tried to make the people that did not like her really, really loud. Uh, because we wanted, like a conflict, we wanted actually the people that were liking her to have to take a stand. Either you're again, you're like with the haters or you're with the feminists. So we tried to create this conflict. So making the haters working for us. What we did is that we wanted people to think that she was an idiot. They had this great suggestion of evil, leveling out the unjust wages. Women earn a lot less for doing the same work. We wanted to illustrate this, so we took 100,000 kroner, which they didn't have, so we had to give it to them. Then we burned this money, saying that this is the amount of money that the Swedish women lose every minute in comparison to the Swedish men. Uh, and we burned it. Uh, and, of course, people got super upset, saying, you cannot burn money, that's like horrible, you could use this money for like, other stuff. And I would say that 99% of the comments on the, in the comments field in the Swedish tabloids were super upset with what we did. It, and it was basically the people that did not really like her from the very beginning. It was like the white, like the white middle-aged men that kind of don't like vegetarians, communists, feminists, all these things. They become like super upset with her, which made that the young 
people, the younger crowd, and mainly the women, they wanted to position themselves against these people, and all of a sudden they get like 2,000% more members that month in comparison to the month before, just because we created this conflict. Um, a weird story is that when I was there just about to set fire to this barbecue, uh, burning the money, a, a journalist from Berlingske uh, Tidinge called me, like this Danish newspaper, asking me if it's true that Gudrun Schumann, who is the leader of the Swedish, Swedish Feminist Party, was about to eat 100,000 kroner. And then I said, no, it's not true. And then kind of I immediately regretted because it would have been such a great headline if she was. But the, but the, the, the symbolic means of eating 100,000 kroner is super hard to figure out. But the, the, like burning it is very symbolic. Eating them is like so-so. It's kind of hard to. So trying to make enemies. Next thing, when, if you're coming from the old system, buying ads, it makes a lot of sense trying to have a target group. Because if you want, for instance, to reach dentists in Roskilde, you, have, like, you cannot reach everyone, so you kind of buy ads in one specific media to get there. Um, what we think is, since we're not really into that, and I don't know that many dentists, but I think that they also watch the 9 o'clock news. So in tr rather than trying to be very target them specifically, try to talk to everyone. And basically, if you're trying to create a story, that's relevant for all of Denmark, or maybe even for the whole world, it will be easier for you to get your story talked about in the media, and then you will also reach the dentists. Because in the, in the kind of elevated target group, everyone, there's also room for a lot of dentists. Um, an illustration of this is Swedish, the leaders of the Swedish political parties. We wanted them to talk about there's a need for culture. We need to discuss culture more. The leaders of the polit political parties didn't talk about this. Uh, and by targeting, and our assignment was target these like six people. And then we said, OK, we're not going to do that. We're going to target all of Sweden. Because th then they will be part of that group, and then they will also have to relate to that. What we did was that we founded a political party um, and our, the people asking us to do this was the National Theatre. They had no money, but they had like a lot of interesting people supporting them, like famous actors, artists, painters, musicians, whatever. And then we asked these people, could you imagine, uh, see yourself being part of a cultural party, uh, promoting cultural issues? And then they said, yeah, sure, they could do that. And then we just like collected these people, this was basically a hoax. We held a press conference and said that today we're going to launch a new political party. Uh, and of course, since they were cultural celebrities, the media were there. Uh, everyone kind of liked this. It was like super confused. They had like no real idea of politics, these actors. Uh, but the, the point was to get everyone talking about culture. The minister of defense that kind of we suggested was this guy. It was Ulle Jungström. And he wanted to become the Minister of Defense because he always wanted to drive a tank. That was like his only reason for doing that. Just by getting talked about like this, we reached 11.9% of the Swedish votes in a poll, which made the politicians really freak out, uh, saying that, OK, there's no need for a cultural party. We got our own cultural policy. Uh, all of a sudden, everyone started talking about culture, and then we revealed that this was all basically just a theater play that we did uh, in order to uh, get people talk, start talking about cultural issues. This is also a way of not like trying to target a few, instead target everyone, and, and it's much easier to get the story out. Five, big in Japan. Coming from a quite small country, Sweden, I think this goes for Denmark as well, um, sometimes it's easier to sort of go east to end up west. Everything that happens here that gets international attention usually becomes really big in Denmark or Sweden. For instance, if like a Swedish actor gets like a very small role as like a supporting role in Hollywood, it becomes like headline news in Sweden. Uh, I guess the same thing goes for Denmark. And coming from these small, almost like fair tale countries, it's kind of easy to get the attention ab uh, abroad, I would say. What we did here is that we wanted the Austrian people 
to talk about the pension system. And then we said, okay, but then we have to make the pension system famous abroad. We invented a sex school uh, saying that this is an alternative way of fixing the problem of a failing pension system. More kids means this problem will resolve itself. So we founded a sex school. Uh, this is, and we made it big. I got like about two minutes left. Has your partner ever told you that you're... And it got talked about like abroad. And then, Has your of course, since it became famous abroad, it became also famous in Austria. So you could, by targeting an international audience, make it big locally. Uh, this one, I think, since I'm running out of time, this one I will skip. And I will jump to my conclusion, which is, which is this. So you've got the attention. You're in the spotlight. And more important, actually, than what you do. You could basically do a lot of different things, that, as I, I strongly advise is that why you did it. Uh, so that could be like for you want to innovate, you want to be passionate, you want to do like a lot of different stuff, but what people will remember you for is why you did it. And basically, whatever it is, it needs to be a story interesting, to, interesting enough to be retold. And it's not that much about what you did. It, it's actually more about what other people people tell each other about what you did. That's it. Thanks for having me. Thank you very, very much for this great talk.